So let me welcome everybody to the Institute this morning. First of all, everyone, welcome to Nick again. <coughs> Thanks for coming back. And uh, thank you all gentlemen for being with us this morning. Uh, this is an in-house briefing by Nick Ferrelli on Myanmar issues on which he has tremendous expertise by now. He's been working on the issue for the last couple of years and we have had interactions before at the Institute and otherwise and we know that Nick has some of the best first-hand information from the ground as things happen in Myanmar. We also fortunate to have our former ambassador to Yangon who has very recent experience of that country. And as we see Myanmar, a lot is happening there, both in the political front, in the security front, and also in the ethiopolitical front related to Bangladesh, especially on the issues of Rohingya, the rise of Buddhist militancy, the issues of ethnic issues internally and effects <coughs> externally to Bangladesh and the neighborhood. But unfortunately, in Bangladesh, not much attention is paid there on Myanmar. And we haven't got the expertise to understand many of the complexities of Myanmar. My institute has been consistently looking at Myanmar for many years, and I think it's critically important for that. Nick, thank you again for coming. And we will now open the floor to you so that you can give a briefing. After that, we have an interactive session with all of you present here. Thank mm -hmm. you, Nick, again. Thank you. The floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much, General, for those kind words of introduction and welcome. I must say it's a genuine pleasure and delight to be back here at the Institute and to once again have the opportunity to reflect on Myanmar's situation in the company of such a distinguished audience here in Dhaka. Uh, when I uh, came to Dhaka last year, uh, I did so, as it happens, uh, with a visa provided by uh, the former ambassador's embassy in Yangon. Uh, and while I was procuring that visa, we had some brief interaction and I will be forever grateful for uh, your goodwill and support. And I must say it's um, uh, a, a great uh, and an extra privilege for me to have you in the audience here this morning. So, so thank you, former ambassador, for your attention. I look forward to your input, I must say, because there are perhaps um, few people on earth who know more about recent Bangladesh-Myanmar relations uh, than your esteemed self. So um, it should be, I hope, a, a lively opportunity for us to, to share views. And I'm hoping that um, my presence here this morning allows us all to reflect on how Myanmar is adjusting in this time of great transformation. Uh, my presentation will naturally enough have an emphasis on issues that are relevant to Bangladesh. But I, I won't dwell solely on such issues because I, I'm hoping to give you all an appreciation of how it is that Myanmar's transformation is occurring across the length and the breadth of the country. Those of you who have seen me present in the past um, will appreciate uh, that I, I like a, an illustrated presentation, lots of pictures. Um, uh, and when Shafkat extended the very kind invitation uh, to speak here today, um, the suggestion was made that if we can put everything in the context of implications for Bangladesh, um, then we'll be off to a good start. So let me begin um, with something that's far from the Bangladesh-Myanmar borderland um, with which we are so very familiar, which, but which is right up on another one of Myanmar's contested frontiers. This is an image which was released last month by Myanmar's Ministry of Defence. It's a very unusual image for lots of reasons. It's an image of a Myanmar military funeral, uh, which uh, was broadcast not only in newspapers and on television, but also across the internet. And in Myanmar today, Facebook has gone absolutely crazy. Uh, it's hard to believe that for a country where five years ago the internet was almost non-existent, uh, Facebook has become, and Twitter and all the rest, utterly ubiquitous. And so this kind of imagery, in my experience at least, almost 15 years of studying Myanmar, I've never seen a picture of a Tapador funeral. And, and here we go uh, in February 2015 with a simultaneous funeral rite for 47 uh, Myanmar army troops who were killed in a battle with Gokang rebels along the border with China. Um, I'm going to come back to this particular situation later in my presentation because I think it helps us to understand a few of the complexities and contradictions in Myanmar's current circumstances all of which I think are relevant to any consideration of Bangladesh's position. 
time. But beginning with the austere and somber ceremony up there on the China border. I've got a pretty simple structure for this talk today. Um, I'm going to very briefly outline what Myanmar's transition is, is all about. Um, I think among this company at least, I, I need to labor those points. Um, I'll then give you what I judge to be the, the four or five most pressing issues in Myanmar today. I'll then reflect on what the 2015 general election will likely hold for the country. Um, I'll try to answer the question, where does Bangladesh fit into some of the scenarios that might emerge? And then finally, I'll have a, a grouping of take-home messages. And I hope those messages are, are useful for the discussion that will follow. So let's begin with this question, what is Myanmar's transition? Transition from what, we might ask, and I think the answer is pretty simple. Uh, Myanmar was a military regime. Uh, governed in succession by General Ne Win and then General Dan Shui for almost five decades uh, until uh, February of 2011. It was the State Peace and Development Council that was formally in charge and then in, in an earlier period until 1988 uh, it was the socialist and often uh, described as xenophobic military regime of General Ne Win. Of course the, the other fundamental military personality of the country's 20th century history was General Aung San, uh, the pro-independence hero and uh, as we all know the father of the country's democratic leader, uh, Do Aung San Suu Kyi. So this imagery I think is useful and it helps to set the tone for everything that's happened since because after almost five decades of direct military rule Something astounding happened. Something happened uh, during the period of the former ambassador's time in Yangon, which many people failed to predict. Um, it came, I think, as quite a shock to those who'd been watching the country so closely and had wondered whether the military would ever lessen its stranglehold. But lessen it, they did. What happened with that uh, lessening of the stranglehold, though, is, of course, uh, not so straightforward. And in particular, <coughs> Myanmar remains a country with a, a great deal of military influence in all aspects of national life. Um, I can illustrate that point in many ways, but let's just go with this map. It shows you the key concentrations of military forces around the country. Uh, the Myanmar uh, Armed Forces, Army, Navy and Air Force have something like 350,000 uniformed personnel uh, in a country perhaps of only 51 or 52 million people. Um, the army, because of its role in counterinsurgency operations over so many decades and in so many corners of the country, um, has very significant footprints. Um, they're not just along one of the borders, they're in basically all corners. Uh, you can see here that there's a, a lesser footprint along the frontier uh, with India. Uh, those tend to be quite rugged and remote areas, uh, but certainly along the border with Thailand, the border with China, uh, even the border with Bangladesh, there are very significant outposts of military authority uh, and these of course are supported by the very significant and ongoing political role of the armed forces and its leadership in central areas of the country. And if you go say to uh, Myanmar's new capital of Nipinor, you get a very strong sense of just how enduring the, the military's role in this system has been. Um, and Naypyidaw, uh, as the new capital, uh, now 10 years old though, so it's, it's not that new, uh, uh, is right slap bang in the middle of Myanmar. And this is a reorientation of, of national power. It provides Myanmar's decision makers uh, with a special vantage on the country. Um, the impression they always had was that Yangon, the, the old Rangoon, uh, was a colonial relic, uh, a city full of foreigners, uh, a city which didn't serve the purposes of uh, the Myanmar system at large. And so for that reason, the, the move to Nabidor, which has been conducted at enormous expense, countless billions have been spent on this new city, um, uh, is something which is being done with a consistent purpose uh, and an effort to change the way that politics is thought about inside the country. And as the former ambassador knows, when you go to Nebidor um, for the first time, it's very surprising because it is so big. Uh, it is 
like almost nothing on earth, although I should say, and Shafkat, I think, and Obai and some others will back me up on this, um, that Canberra, my own hometown in Australia, it's a little bit like a, a mini version of Naypyidaw. Okay, so Canberra, of course, is a, a planned city, a city that's now uh, 102 years old. Um, so we've got uh, a fair bit more history than Naypyidaw, um, but in a, the Australian context, we've also built uh, a tailor-made city um, to do the administrative business. Uh, Naypyidaw, roughly translated as abode of kings, um, is the version for Myanmar. This is the, the key site, I'd suggest, uh, for power projection in Myanmar today. The power projection that matters most for Myanmar <coughs> is focused on bringing the unruly margins together. Uh, this image uh, is one taken from the upper house foyer of the uh, parliament there in Naypyidaw. You can see some of the variations in national dress of some of Myanmar's 135 national race groups. This is taken very seriously, this idea of national races. And we'll come back to the theme later in the presentation because it's so fundamental to many issues, including the, the Myanmar-Bangladesh relationship. All of this matters because I think it's fair to say that while we're looking at a recent transformation of Myanmar's internal arrangements, um, there's a much longer history to bear in mind. Yes, the 20th century was difficult for the people of Myanmar, to say I think that the 19th century was difficult too but if you wind the clock back you find that many parts of what we now know as Myanmar were never really governed in the way that we would expect a modern nation state to govern them and there's a, a, a now very prominent book published in 2009 by the American political scientist Jim Scott it's called The Art of Not Being Governed um, it's already been cited more than a thousand times I recall uh, it's a very heavy duty, Yale University Press published tome, and it's all about the way that people in Myanmar and adjacent border areas, to include in some parts of Bangladesh, Northeast India, Southwest China, Northern Thailand, Northern Vietnam and elsewhere, have evaded the state. How people have gone about getting away from the centralizing force of a place like Nepal. I think this is a really important idea to consider if we don't just look at the last 50 years or the last 150 years, we start to think about how this kind of terrain with the mountains, the deep valleys, the hundreds of languages, the many different cultural variations actually makes it very hard for central governments to do what they want to do. It's hard to collect taxes, it's hard to enlist local men in your army. They often want to fight for themselves in their own rebel outfits. It's, it's hard to ensure that everybody knows the same language or deals in the same concepts. And so Scott's book is about this. I think it's useful to appreciate what it can tell us because Scott, in this particular book, recycles a concept that the historian of Bangladesh and adjacent areas, Willem van Schendel, has used, I think, to great effect to describe this area shaded on the map, which he calls Zomia. Uh, and Zomia, uh, I guess a, a reinterpretation of Zomi, uh, a group Mizo uh, in India, uh, uh, particularly in Mizoram, uh, who in Van Schendel and then Scott's interpretation uh, have something in common that they don't have in common with the people of the lowlands. So if I just get my cursor to work here, perhaps or it won't. So, okay, switches on. Perfect, there we go, thank you. You can see there that right in the middle of that shaded area is Naypyidaw, right? Right where the arrow is. So that is Naypyidaw today. Um, and it's one of the key sites, I suppose, that you would desire, if you were so inclined, for projecting your influence out into these otherwise rebellious, even lawless zones. Um, and the area here that's shaded there, if I'm not mistaken, just in the corner between Northeast India and uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar is of course your own Chittagong Hill Tract, an area which has its own history of uh, difficulties for state authority. Um, and I think when we turn our attention to what Myanmar is going through right now and what its really biggest issues are, we need to have this kind of map in mind. 
a, a map which suggests that there are people who, over many hundreds of years, have struggled against some of the centralizing forces at play. So, that's Myanmar's transformation, both in the short term and the long term. Some of my thoughts there on the summary of this transformation I think are perhaps useful. Uh, Myanmar's <coughs> arguably a wealthier, more peaceful, more democratic, and fundamentally more successful society than it has pretty much ever been. Uh, that would be the consensus among the senior Myanmar officials of my acquaintance. Um, at the same time though, and this is in the very next breath, plenty of things aren't going according to plan and many of the most important challenges are on the borders. We started with that imagery of the funeral for 47 Myanmar soldiers killed up on the border with China. That's not the only place where there are dramas and where there is grief. So Myanmar, if I was to summarize it, I'd say more or less a very good news story, unusually and unexpectedly so, but key issues need to be given full consideration. Otherwise, I think the analysis we offer uh, will be completely off kilter. So let's get to those key issues. I'm going to give you five of them. All right. Starting with Buddhist nationalism, and this is uh, an issue that uh, the general very helpfully uh, alluded to in his introductory remarks. This is arguably the biggest one. Right? This is arguably the one that has the most destructive potential for Myanmar internally and for its relations with the rest of the world. How this is managed, how their authorities and, and wise men and monks and others come up with better ways of managing Buddhist fury um, will likely determine what happens next and how much the rest of the international community is prepared to accept the changes that are underway inside Myanmar. Many of you will be familiar with this kind of imagery. Right? So this is the distinctive sticker, which you see almost everywhere, of the 969 movement. And it's perhaps started to, to fade out as some other uh, very well-resourced and prominent Buddhist nationalist organizations are coming into the fray. Uh, but still, 969, this was the, the movement that lit the torch for plenty of people uh, when it came to mobilizing as Buddhist nationalists, often against their Muslim neighbors. Here again, you see that sticker, and you see another very interesting map. Um, and if you look closely at the map, you'll get the impression uh, that for some of Myanmar's monks, um, there is a, a clear and present threat in their minds from their Muslim neighbors. And they put this in stark terms. They talk of invasion, and they talk of an existential threat. Um, when you look at that map, it's a pretty simple message. It is that the countries far to the west, in Central Asia and in the Middle East, comprehensively Islamic. Uh, India, of course, is a country which uh, has a mixed Hindu-Muslim population. Bangladesh, a majority Muslim population. And then there are those yellow countries as shaded on this map. So Thailand, Laos, uh, Cambodia, and of course Myanmar. And the idea for many 969 people, is that uh, Myanmar is the front line in what perhaps Huntington once upon a time called a clash of civilizations. Uh, they don't refer to it in those terms. Uh, they consider, though, that Rakhine State, as the Western Gate, needs to be defended against what, in their mind, um, is an onslaught of uh, Muslim migrants and those, who, of course, who take the most radical perspective. Uh, we'll try to call them invaders. And this is where the really hard line of Myanmar politics, I think, starts to bump up against what those in the rest of the region uh, are going to be wanting to consider. It was a couple of years ago uh, that this chap vaulted to prominence, and the former ambassador will, of course, recognize him because he's, he's none other than Muratu. And Muratu is a, a, a monk based in a monastery uh, in Mandalay, um, he became the face of the Buddhist terror. Uh, and I think the, the last time I was uh, giving a, a presentation in this room, I reflected on one of my own experiences in Rakhine State. But I, I may just offer a few words uh, on that particular uh, incident again. I went to one of his lectures in Rakhine State, where he was lecturing to a, a, a large group of village level Buddhists some of whom would have been ardent nationalists, some of whom, uh, frankly, were just there for the spectacle. 
because Waratu coming is a really big event. As a big preacher, he come to town, and I asked some of the people there in the audience. I said, "Oh, what do you, what do you think of Waratu?" And they said, "Well, we hadn't heard of him." Okay, and I wasn't sure what to make of this. And I said, what do you mean you hadn't heard of him? And they said, we hadn't heard of him until Time Magazine. I said, really? What, what do you mean? And they said, well, we saw Time Magazine, the face of Buddhist terror, and then we thought, yeah, he's our guy. This is our guy. So this particular magazine cover made him famous. At least some people in Rakhine State were trying to tell me that. It's interesting because this image and the phrase, the face of Buddhist terror, has become a really potent set of, of mobilizing forces in Myanmar more generally. Uh, people go out and march like this, right? They cross out the face of Buddhist terror. So this is a 969 uh, uh, mobilization in Yangon a couple of years ago. Um, and these are the sorts of people who are prepared to march in favor of Muratu and the sort of Buddhist nationalist fury that he espouses. On the other side, of course, there are other sorts of mobilizations against the Buddhist nationalist thrust. And they've happened in many countries around the world. Some of the largest back in 2012 were actually in Indonesia, but there have been similar um, efforts uh, in Malaysia and elsewhere across the Muslim world. Um, of course, this Buddhist nationalist element I think is probably the number one key issue. Uh, it's the one that continues to fester uh, and has the constant destructive potential um, that I think everybody needs to be looking at closely. And as 969 morphs into Mabata and other groups, there's all sorts of reasons to think that we haven't seen the worst of what Buddhist nationalism will mean for Myanmar. The second set of key issues I describe as battles on many fronts. And, yeah. Right now, there are battles around Yangon. Uh, student protests have been mobilized, uh, and those student protests have now seen the, the heavy hand of the Myanmar security forces. Uh, <coughs> some of you who have seen the footage will probably appreciate that it appears to be a relatively amateur effort to control an otherwise peaceful uh, student group. Um, there's a baton charge, it is unedifying. Um, and it's difficult now because the European Union was spending $10 million on retraining the Myanmar riot police so that they would do a better job in handling these kinds of incidents. Uh, and the European Union delegations in Yangon have had to re release a, a very carefully worded statement um, in an effort to ensure that, that that sort of training isn't undermined by what's just happened. There's a chance, of course, um, that the government now will face even even further student uh, efforts to undermine its authority. It's a pretty tense time, and uh, plenty of people have now been locked up. Fortunately, nobody has been killed. Uh, but the history of student protest in Myanmar suggests that um, that can't be relied on for long. At the same time, there are all sorts of other battles happening around the country's borders. Perhaps the most uh, Important of those have been between the Kachin Independence Army and the Central Authority. Uh, that war reignited back in June 2011, uh, but it's a war that goes right back to 1961, uh, and who knows exactly what will happen there. Uh, it's possible that thousands of people on both sides have been killed, uh, and that's only one of the battles that has been rumbling along in this recent, more democratic, uh, and overall more peaceful situation, even though lots of things are still going wrong. And if I was to give you the third heading here of key issues to think through, it's something like frustrated liberalization. Uh, Myanmar is doing what it can at the high levels uh, to put in place policies that look like they could work long term, but it's still very hard to actually make it stick. I mentioned earlier that there are these 135 national race categories. Um, and you'd sort of think that at some stage those categories will need to be reconsidered. They are artifacts often of poor ethnography, of, of muddled categorization. It's really hard for people to get their heads around them, even when they come from one of the groups in question, let alone for the rest of us. When you go to Rakhine State, and you go to the Rakhine State Cultural Museum, uh, you have these cabinets, like literally cabinets with mannequins in them, that show you the, uh, the 
the only recognized national races of Rakhine State. One of those groups happens to be a Muslim group called the Kamar or Kamai, and they are the descendants, it is understood, of 17th century uh, Persian mercenaries who ended up in that part of the world. Um, but uh, the other key Muslim group, of course, in Rakhine State are those who designate themselves as Rohingya. Rohingya do not get a spot in the Rakhine State Cultural Museum. Okay? I won't labor the point, but it's a pretty obvious one. They're excluded, uh, and their opportunity to enjoy the rights of the other 135 national races um, are a pipe dream. Uh, and while that remains the case, plenty of other issues are likely to follow. The thought of liberalization is also apparent in the difficulties that the National League for Democracy faces. You see a lot of National League for Democracy stuff all over Myanmar today. You can see pictures of Aung San Suu Kyi all over the place. And I suppose I've been doing this long enough that I remember when you go to somebody's house and they would quietly go to the bookshelf and open a book and inside they would have a secret photo of Aung San Suu Kyi, right? They wouldn't want anybody to see it, but they'd want to show you that they had this a subversive uh, image, an image perhaps of hope and democratic instinct. Now you see National League for Democracy stuff everywhere. You can buy it in markets. They sell Aung San Suu Kyi t-shirts to tourists all over central Yangon. It's, it's no longer considered subversive. Um, but the National League for Democracy is struggling. It's struggling because uh, they don't have a lot of seats in Parliament. They don't have all of the authority that they used to claim <coughs> as a, a moral force. So they're trying to do something to make the system better from inside the system. And I think the frustrations are often <coughs> immense. Some of those frustrations we've seen just these past couple of weeks. So I was just in Yangon before I came uh, here to Dhaka. Um, I was hanging around at the university and elsewhere trying to understand how it is that uh, the Myanmar student body was responding to recent changes. A lot of people are fed up. They're fed up with a new education law which is being pushed through. Uh, and it came to a head uh, earlier this week when the pushing and the shoving turned into a real law. You can see here what it's like though. You know, it's young riot police, right? These are the guys trained by the European Union, up against very young Myanmar students. Uh, a scene not dissimilar to some of those that you might see on a hot afternoon in some parts of Bangladesh when, when politics gets you know, a bit tough. Um, in this case, I think thankfully nobody ended up dying, but it's still difficult to see how all of these different liberal trends are going to be managed because overall there's something bigger at play. So this is my fourth issue. I won't say too much about it because um, we can perhaps deal with it uh, in questions later on. Uh, but let's talk briefly about big power relations and what they mean for Myanmar. This is the fourth big issue. Um, the sorts of big power relations that Myanmar faces, and I think many of its policy calibrations are not too dissimilar uh, to the, the kinds of responses that Bangladesh itself needs to make. Um, of course, in Myanmar's case, there are these lengthy land borders with both China and India. Uh, it's one of the very few countries on earth that has land borders with both, um, as in I think it's only Pakistan, Nepal, uh, Bhutan and Myanmar uh, that actually share borders with both of what are likely to be this century's most significant geopolitical actors uh, and Myanmar potentially gets squeezed uh, and one interpretation at least of recent changes in Myanmar's internal affairs is that they didn't want to get too close to the Chinese uh, they knew that the West required some liberal trends and perhaps some democratic awakening before they'd be prepared to invest and re-engage politically. And so Myanmar is now walking the tightrope. China is still heavily involved. There are more than two million Chinese citizens or former citizens inside the country uh, and it will be hard to get the Chinese entanglements off the table. Nobody's proposing that will happen. Instead, what seems to be the the maybe or sense of the best foreign policy approach in the decades ahead is to have everybody involved. That means the US, the Europeans, Chinese, Indians, Thais, Singaporeans, Bangladeshis, hopefully as well. 
Um, and that's going to be complicated, and it will require a great deal of capacity and skill. Uh, right now, Myanmar, I think, often has the skill, because there's a great number of smart people responsible for these issues, doesn't necessarily have the capacity. So how you build up the capacity will be another huge challenge. Last year, as many of you will know, Myanmar was for the first time a host of the ASEAN summit season. So the uh, East Asia summit was held in Naypyidaw. They built about 20 new hotels for the purpose. I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars that alone would have cost, but these are impressive hotels by any standard. Uh, and Myanmar made sure it put its best foot forward last year. Uh, of course, the ASEAN bandwagon has moved on. It'll be another decade before it comes back. Uh, but Myanmar is trying to be an international player. But of course, its economy, uh, its strategic weight and all the rest mean that in the big, great power pushes and shoves, uh, Myanmar could get caught in the middle. And this worries people a great deal. And you see here, the, the photo probably doesn't give all that much away, but this is where uh, Myanmar's 21st century, particularly when it comes to its interaction with China, is going to be interesting no doubt about it, and while there is the kind of fighting right along the China-Myanmar border that we currently see, uh, it would be, I think, a very brave man or woman who would be betting that everything will be smooth. I just think it won't be. So, another area that where things aren't smooth is one that I call online strife. And this is important because uh, Myanmar has changed a great deal in the blink of an eye when it comes to online activities. Um, Quite seriously, uh, if you went to Myanmar 10 years ago and wanted a mobile phone, you'd need about $2,000 in your pocket to get your hands on a mobile phone, okay? If you were in Yangon three years ago and wanted a mobile phone, you'd need about $150 for the SIM card alone. $150 for the SIM card. Just last week, uh, when I was uh, back in Myanmar, I had my old SIM, so I had a $150 one. I never could afford a $2,000 one, but I had a $150 one from the government uh, telecommunications monopoly. But uh, this uh, last uh, little visit, I decided I'll get another SIM, because they're useful, they've got very fast 3G downloads and all the rest, $1.50 uh, for a new SIM card in Yangon today. So that's how much the price has tumbled. It's basically because there's two big new uh, telco players. Uh, one comes from Qatar, uh, Urdu. And one comes from Norway, Telenor, and they are just carving up the Myanmar market. And I know, being here in Dhaka, that internet speeds are much better than Australia. And so I know that you know a country which gets the right kind of investment at the right time could do amazing things with its internet infrastructure. And Myanmar is just taking that leap right now. And it means a lot of people who were never on the internet, never had an email address, never used Google. They're now online, what are they doing? They're all on Facebook. So Facebook has become the internet ecosystem that almost everybody of my acquaintance in Myanmar is constantly in. It means a lot of political stuff happens only on Facebook and that's why we get this kind of image. Just, you know, don't get people killed by spreading rumors on Facebook uh, because it's just such a frenzy, crazed stuff going round and round. Something else that goes round and round it's this kind of expression of loyalty. Earlier I showed you the shoulder patch of the Kachin Independence Army. This is what it looks like during a war between the Myanmar side and the Kachin side. A lot of Kachin changed their Facebook picture to the crossed swords of the Kachin Independence Army. It's really interesting. The fact that people are prepared to publicly um, invoke this kind of symbolism uh, on the Facebook interface I think this would be interesting if it only happened once. It would be interesting if it never happened when it was related to pro-government elements. But this, just in the last couple of weeks, has become the new trend on Facebook. Everybody is changing their normal Facebook pictures from what you'd expect to see to this particular emblem, uh, which it so happens is the shoulder patch for the Northeast Command the command that is fighting against the Kokan rebels. So those 47 soldiers uh, who were killed up there and the funerals that we saw on my first slide, um, they are being presented in the Facebook world in relation to this kind of support for the Northeast Command. 
Um, I've been doing this for quite a while. I can't think of any other circumstance in which there has been a popular movement in Myanmar to offer this kind of support for the armed forces. It's a new thing, a very interesting thing. Potentially tells us something about anti-China sentiment. Potentially tells us something about the way that the armed forces are becoming a, a much more legitimate political player. I don't think we have any answers to some of these questions, but, but nobody is having a gun put to their head and forced to change their imagery. They're doing so perhaps out of peer pressure, but also because of a different kind of socialization. So, yes. As far as the CIA supporter accounts are concerned, are those all real accounts of real people? Oh yeah, absolutely. So these are real people who will i would be very confident in using it. These are all real people here too. Yeah, so this is yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, but people are, you know, on all sides confident. They don't no longer feel threatened by the sorts of things that would have um, been anxiety causing even five years ago. Which like this for me, when I first saw it, I learned about it from one of my PhD students. Um, and I didn't believe it. Yeah, he brought this into my office and said, I'm gonna need, where's the proof? And he did it. He brought it up on his phone and showed me and we were reading through some of the stuff and, I found it astounding. Uh, and this is all part of a new politics, something that, that the transition, the semi-democratic system has unleashed, all now made possible uh, by the internet, by the fact that everybody has these $1.50 SIM cards in their phones, they've got the good 3G on their mobiles and off they go. And but where this ends, what happens next, what happens in the election year, I think these are the really important things for us to consider. So next question, what do the 2015 general elections hold? Let me just start by saying we don't know when the elections will be, okay? Under the, the regulatory framework, they only need to give 90 days notice, okay? So we'll have the starter's whistle, 90 days out we will know that the election is happening. Uh, and that will be a frenzy period. It'll be when the campaign happens for real. Everybody is holding back until they really know for sure which date it will be. The betting money is late October, early November, um, but there's a, a broader window in which they could schedule it. So once we get close to that 90 days, um, people will start to get very intrigued by exactly when the election will be held. The current electoral map looks roughly like this. Uh, the green here is held by the Union Solidarity and Development Party, which spun out of the old military regime. Uh, the yellow here is held by ethnic minority parties, and the red is held by democratic parties. Uh, the democratic parties did very well in an April 2012 by-election, um, and so that's more or less the breakdown at the moment. Still over 70% of elected seats are held by the old uh, military regime backed party. The National League for Democracy has something like 7% of seats in the lower house of the, the Union Assembly. Um, so overall though, there's no part of the country where the old military regime doesn't currently hold sway and that includes Rakhine State. Uh, and Rakhine State is one area where after the 2015 election, the local assembly at least, is likely to be held by somebody else, in that case by Rakhine Buddhist nationalists. I went to the trouble, and it's a bit risky, of sketching out what I think some of the hypothetical 2015 election results could be. So let's just run through these quick scenarios. First scenario is a win for the incumbent government, okay? So what's the consequence of that? I think there's going to be international concern. No one's going to re-implement sanctions. That seems very uh, unlikely, but this is a high, a higher probability scenario. Um, and I think for Bangladesh, under such circumstances, it'd be more or less business as usual. A lot of the things we've seen in the last, say, uh, five to 10 years are likely to continue uh, bubbling along. A National League for Democracy win, on the other hand, would be greeted by what I describe as general celebration. I think people around the world would be uh, very pleased with such an outcome. That's probably, and again, it's always hard to say, that's more likely than a USDP win. All right? So that's the kind of outcome that I think we need to, to be taking pretty seriously. It would require rapid readjustment from pretty much everybody, I think, to include Bangladesh. And if I think, say, of Australian policy towards Myanmar, it would change 
uh, not immediately, but uh, pretty quickly, uh, because Aung San Suu Kyi and her people would have big plans that they'd be looking for something new and different. What if there's a mixed result, a result where we get a coalition? Um, perhaps the USDP and the NLD have to govern together, maybe supported by ethnic parties, because nobody can form a government in their own right. I think there's, under those circumstances, the potential for some internal unrest, probably not at a, at a huge scale, um, but it'd be hard because Myanmar in recent generations at least hasn't had that kind of messy internal coalition politics. And speaking to uh, a room of such distinguished analysts as yourself, so experienced in Bangladeshi affairs, I, I, I don't think I need to overemphasize just how tricky a coalition arrangement could end up being if it were to emerge in Myanmar. Um, there's likely to be some pretty poor outcomes from such a result, and I think that is probably more likely than either an NLD or a USDP win. So where some kind of balance of power, power sharing arrangement emerges after the election. Some people like to suggest that there's um, uh, actually elements in the constitution that almost uh, predetermine that kind of messy outcome um, after a certain period of this democratic movement. And the final option there, it's not the only other option, but I think it's one of the most serious we need to consider, is if there's no election, could well be that there is no election this year. If that were to be the case, um, there is the potential for things to go really badly wrong, but people are betting on the election. A lot of huge investments, multi-billion dollar investments, are predicated on uh, Myanmar continuing to improve and continuing to become more democratic. Um, a lot of people would lose a lot. Uh, it's not impossible that this would happen. I judge it unlikely, but I think it's worth bringing to the table because we'll only know 90 days out whether an election is being held. It means that the incumbents, that is President Thane Sein, uh, and the military commander-in-chief have a lot of say over the timing of what happens next. And if it proves that over the next few months there's more student protests, there's more labor strikes. There are other things going on internally that mean that the government isn't confident. And maybe they say, hey, the people aren't ready for an election. Uh, we know how that often then starts to turn out. It would be a, a difficult set of circumstances. And because of the level of international attention, uh, it would likely lead to some outcomes which are quite undesirable. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I think a mixed result, even though I'm a bit pessimistic about its short-term ramifications, could actually be a good thing if people were learning to work together in ways that they haven't in the past. It's difficult to be too uh, brazen, though, about our prognosis for Myanmar's democratic prospects, because in mean, the broader neighbourhood, I mean, particularly in Southeast Asia, I know South Asia is a different story, but in Southeast Asia, uh, Myanmar is now one of the more democratic societies, right? more democratic than Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Brunei, arguably Malaysia and Singapore. Um, so it's in the top third, perhaps, of ASEAN societies on a lot of democratic metrics. Um, so does, does that survive? Does Myanmar society have the capacity to regenerate a democratic culture given all these other pressures? Uh, we just don't know. It hasn't been done before. And that will be, I think, the huge test. And this is where the Myanmar people will need a lot of support and interest, I think, including from Bangladesh. And of course, that's what brings us here today. And I'm just, in the final part of my presentation, going to give you three what I'd suggest are possible futures for the way that Bangladesh and Myanmar might be interacting in this context. And I'm, I'd be particularly pleased to hear any of your feedback on these sorts of scenarios, because I think uh, some of you have a great deal more knowledge and experience than I do. So the tentative future that I think is perhaps something like business as usual, uh, we might call mutual ignorance, uh, where because in Myanmar, we uh, tend to be preoccupied with China, and here in Bangladesh, the preoccupation tends to be either internally or with India when it comes to foreign affairs. There just isn't all that much bandwidth uh, for doing things between the two countries. And so let's just assume that that continues to be the pattern. What does that mean? Uh, it means there'll be misunderstandings, there'll be flare-ups, 
there'll be problems, most of which will be well managed um, by the officials involved. At a personal level, there'll be a lot of trust, I think it's fair to say, um, but socially, uh, when it comes to Bangladeshis at large and Myanmar at large, um, we won't necessarily see a great deal of people-to-people -people links and we won't see the kind of rich relationship in other areas that would lead to long-term success. So I think it's fair to say that under conditions of such mutual ignorance, um, the two countries don't get in each other's way, um, but they can't become the best of friends. And that's probably something like the situation that we have at the moment. Um, I note that back in January, uh, the Speaker of the Union Assembly, uh, former General and former number three in the old regime, pictured here in the yellow, was scheduled to come to Dhaka. Don't think he ever made it. Um, which is unfortunate because he is potentially uh, going to be the next president of the country. And to have him here in Dhaka would send a really good positive signal, I think, both to the uh, Bangladesh uh, foreign policy and security establishment, but also to people back home in Myanmar, uh, that uh, former general uh, and now speaker of the parliament, Shui Man, uh, is prepared to be working closely with Bangladesh. And I assume that some of the other political issues uh, made his visit more difficult to schedule at this time. Uh, but if we're going to get past mutual ignorance, there needs to be more of that, from my perspective as an outsider at least, uh, more opportunity for the two sides to get to know each other and to work together. So that's a scenario that's business as usual, a scenario that perhaps takes what's been happening and amplifies it we could call frontier fiascos. I think this is very difficult for everybody, very difficult for Myanmar. All of the politics that I've sketched out, whether that's battles in other parts of the country or the particular issues to do with this nationalism, I think suggest that if there are future flare-ups of violence, like what we saw in 2012, Bangladesh and Myanmar could be in much grimmer circumstances. Um, I think that the appetite for violence in Myanmar remains high, and I still hear people, they tell me pretty outrageous things about their lack of trust in their Muslim neighbours, um, and for that to happen either in Rakhine State or elsewhere could be very destructive. And I'd, I think it's important to raise some of the challenges that this would present because um, say here on the Bangladesh side of the border there would be the potential for large scale and further movements of people uh, for destabilisation around Cox's and Technuf. Uh, you all know what happened at Ramu in 2012. Um, the potential for further incidents of that type uh, in that part of the country or elsewhere um, back in 2013, the Indonesian security forces um, managed, we understand, to, to thwart a bomb plot against the Myanmar embassy in Jakarta. Um, I, um, without being overly dramatic about it, wonder just how badly things could have gone if the Indonesians weren't on their toes and such a plot had succeeded. Um, for a Myanmar embassy to be attacked in Muslim Southeast Asia or Muslim South Asia, I think would be a, a very difficult thing and it would likely lead to all sorts of other dramas along this frontier. So that's scenario number two. <coughs> scenario number three I think is, is even more serious. This is a scenario where the two countries just can't get along and I think that the level of trust that has been built up over the last say five years, appears to have become flimsier, more fragile. Uh, and Bangladesh and Myanmar, I think, are now having to consider well, how do they get past the, the blockages and the entrenched positions, and how do they build the social trust that's going to be required. In Myanmar, you read a lot of good things. This is a speech from President Thein Sein, published in the government mouthpiece, draw a demarcation line between politics and religion. It's really easy to put it on the page, it's really hard to do it in practice. And President Thein Sein, Wu Shui Man, all the rest, I think they appreciate that this is hugely sensitive and problematic. And I don't think there's any appetite in Myanmar for a confrontation with Bangladesh. Uh, but because of the level of mobilisation along this Buddhist Muslim fault line, uh, flashpoint technuf scenario where it gets out of hand, 
I think is a concern, and it concerns me as an outsider because I first and foremost worry about the humanitarian consequences of that. I think it would be um, uh, disastrous for there to be uh, the sort of conflict that might occur when, uh, if a more nationalist frame of mind takes ascendancy in Naypyidaw, uh, perhaps conditions in Bangladesh also uh, point towards uh, greater confrontation. That sort of future would be one that I think we should all be worried about. So what are my take home messages? Point number five, and then I look forward to opening up this up to discussion. So what do we need to know? The transition is continuing, it's going pretty well, but it's turbulent, and I know